Good morning. Do you realize this is the first cloudy day we've had in two years for a Saturday prostate cancer support group meeting? We have a gray May morning, and uh, but we're going to enliven it because we got a great subject and uh, nano knife, and not cyber knife, nano knife. So you're going to. When you say that, you have to have an R with a circle around it when you say that. Uh, I'm George Johnson. I'm your facilitator for today. And uh, we want to thank uh, the facility uh, owner, which is the Sanford Burnham Brevis Medical Discovery Institute. They do a lot of discovering here. And uh, we're very thankful for them to allow us to uh, to use this facility, so please help us uh, keep it clean. I know you'll do that. And uh, this thing does, is not a one-man show. It takes a team of people to make things work. And uh, these are the volunteers uh, that uh, make things work for, for you. And uh, if you want to join us in this endeavor, uh, see me or, or Gene, and we'd, we'd be happy to accommodate you. Let me introduce who's here. Gene, there's Gene. Gene is a, a special person. He has had almost every treatment possible, so he knows, knows it all. So if you got a question about treatment, he's a good one to talk to. Uh, I'm next, and uh, I'm in charge of uh, getting speakers to come join us. If you've got a suggested speaker, uh, see me after the meeting and let me know. Uh, and uh, then Bill Manning is in the back there with the box with the red light on it. He's the guy that's responsible for the wonderful CDs that uh, become available uh, a month uh, after the meeting. In case you can't make the next meeting, there'll be a CD available for a bargain discount price for you guys only of $10. And, uh, and then we got uh, uh, John Tassie. There he is. He's in the back, and he's watching to make sure you're all wide awake. And uh, then we, we got Steve, who's, who writes our newsletter. Steve, wave there. And uh, he does a wonderful job, including some, uh, some st uh, good research stories and some attempts at humor. And Bill Bailey, who's our librarian. And look what, the, he has more exercise than anybody. All those boxes he's got to pack and unpack and bring in and take out. Uh, all this wonderful information. So after the meeting, come take a look at it. Some of it you can rent. Uh, some of it you can buy, and we make a little bit of money off that. And then outside, we have some freebies for you if you want to get something uh, uh, about uh, our speaker or what's going on elsewhere. And we got Chuck Bailey here, who you should see the wiring we got here. Raise your hand, Chuck. Okay. Chuck Grimm. Chuck Grimm. Uh, you should see the wiring here. I, I, I can't. I can't figure it all out, and I'm not supposed to. And then Jim, he's, he's the guy peeking throughout the door there. He's a smiley guy, and he's our, our greeter. He's a happy guy, and he also gets here real early to put the signs up so he can find this place. So he's a multifaceted, and then he remembers to pick them up and put them back in the car when he goes home. See? <laughs> <laughs> you think that's easy, you know, because <laughs> otherwise you have to turn around and come back. <laughs> okay, uh, everybody get a newcomer package that's new to the group. You got a newcomer package? Uh, you, okay, everybody get one? Because uh, we have a cover sheet. I don't know if it's peach or yellow, but anyway, that's a little background cover sheet we'd like you to fill out and, and drop off up here. And the purpose of that is uh, to uh, get you in our mailing list, and uh, also uh, you'll get a call from Gene to see if anything... Uh, you have any questions or need any help. Uh, uh, Gene's uh, w one of our real assets to the group in terms of being a caregiver, too. He's got a lot of answers, so if you've got any questions, talk to him. And uh, in there are some very good uh, articles of what's going on. And uh, so uh, some of you old-timers might be interested in reading some of that stuff to keep current. Okay, our support group, what's our purpose? And we're here to support you. Uh, we're not here to replace your doctor. We're here to support you. Our major mission is to be, help you become your own case manager. 
Uh, you know, your doctor's very busy. He has a lot of patients. You're not the only one. He may or may not be prepared for your visit. You have to be. What I suggest you do is get a copy of every lab report, get a three-ring notebook, put it in there, uh, put your questions in there, particularly the questions you pick up at this meeting, and when you see him, open that up and start asking him questions. And because uh, they're, they forget about you. Uh, when you think you need a PSA, remember to ask them, should I be getting a PSA? Uh, I've been, I saw five doctors in the past uh, two weeks, and uh, they forget about me. And they start talking about maybe things and so forth, and I say, uh, would you recommend that? I'm 85 years old, and I have a, uh, a, a undifferentiated cell structure. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, you, you know, you shouldn't have that. See? And uh, I went to a cardiologist, and he was talking to me about my heart and everything like that, all the little details. And I said, hey, doctor, I'm, I'm 85 years old. What do you think of my heart? 80? Oh, that's right. You've got a good heart, you know, for 85, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, it can be an upper or a downer uh, uh, when you talk to these guys. I have to remind them, you're not just an average patient. And uh, so, so be prepared for that visit, but do see your doctor. Uh, what we hope you accomplish from this meeting is you have questions you want to ask your doctor. See, an important part is one is informing you through great speakers, and we try to make sure we got good speakers and we got an excellent speaker today. Uh, and the next part is networking. Uh, if you've heard about something new or you want to know what it's like to get Proton or Provenge, uh, come to me before the meeting and ask me subject and ask, I'll, I'll survey the group, how many people have had Provenge? And you look at those and figure out who you want to go talk to about that thing. So you can do some informal networking on your own. And the last part is the caring. Give us a call if you need some help and have some puzzlement. And because uh, we've got uh, a lot of experience of, of dealing with that. But we're no substitute to your doctor. Okay, what do we do for you? Uh, we have a, a website, and that's the, uh, the, the website code there. And uh, it's got uh, up-to-date information, uh, research and technology. And then we got this library, I just pointed out to you, where you get DVDs from previous meetings and previous conferences. And uh, you can rent them or buy them. Uh, we've got books and papers. Then there's a newsletter and uh, with regard to new research that's going on. We have an outreach program uh, in terms of if you have, uh, we, we're looking for new members because I think those old timers here feel very strongly how important this program is for them. And so if you've got buddies of your own the same age, there are at least, if you've got six buddies, one of them, He's probably got prostate cancer. So talk to your buddies about, buddies about getting a PSA. And uh, we have the literature that you can get out there and, and share with, uh, with your buddies. And uh, uh, we also are able to give a talk, a little snappy 30-minute talk uh, to a group, a uh, rotary or, or church group or whatever, come in and talk about prostate cancer. And then we have our monthly meetings. and. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit about that. And uh, Dr. Schick, you're going to be talking about that for a moment, what we're going to hear. We have a, a series that I'll, I'll touch on, and this is, we haven't had a diagnostic imaging discussion for some time. It's a key factor in, in tracking uh, prostate cancer. Uh, we have a lit piece of literature out there that's called uh, Euro lift. Anybody ever have a Euro lift? <laughs> you want to say that on the mic? <laughs> I'm just curious. This is a new procedure. Uh, this is for if you have a, uh, the difficulty in urinating, and this is a process of uh, opening up a, your urethra in the prostate and so forth. Just curious how, how you, what experience you've had with it. Does it work? And, uh, I guess nobody's had it. Um, okay. All right, we're going to survey the group, and this is for our speakers, and also for the newcomers, and also for us to just share our uh, situation. 
Please raise your hand in response. So how many are here for the first time? One, two, three, four. Uh, looks like we've got a small number this time. Uh, welcome. Uh, keep coming back. Uh, got any questions? I'll, at the end of the meeting, I'll be down front. And if you got any questions about our group here, uh, come down and talk to me. I'd be happy to help you. How many are recently diagnosed in the last six months? Let's see, a large number of you, yes. All right, how many have had prostate cancer for up to one year? Besides, okay. Uh, how many have had up to four years? Raise your hand. And now, how many have had five to 10? All right, now we're 11 to 15. Okay. For you newcomers, you see what we're doing here. How many have more than 15 years? Raise your hand. I got 20. Who can beat me? Have you got more than 20? What does that mean? Get the gold star. I guess uh, I get the, a freebie. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> there are a lot of us that are able to survive this with proper treatment. That's the whole point of this group, is you learn how to keep keep plugging away. Okay, well, we've got all kinds of treatment. There's uh, over 16 different tri types of uh, prostate cancer treatment. And uh, okay, how many are not under treatment per se, but under active surveillance? Raise your hand. Look at that. See, that's what we have going for us. Uh, uh, for those uh, who are new, uh, there were a few, it used to be called watchful waiting, but it now it's been improved. It's a much more disciplined approach and a much more effective folks rather than jumping right into having surgery. And uh, I think this is where uh, things like MRI are very helpful in tracking your prostate so you don't have to have invasive treatment. Okay, how many have had surgery of all kinds? All right, that used to be the gold standard. Uh, let me ask the next question. Now, some of you, like Gene, have had multiple treatments. How many uh, have had radiation of all kinds? See, a few more than, uh, than surgery. How many uh, have been on uh, active uh, or androgen deprivation therapy, hormone therapy? See how many we got there? Chemotherapy, how many are on chemotherapy? One, two, three, three or four, okay. New treatments, how many are on the new? Provenge, Extandy, uh, not that many. I'm on a new, I'm on one that's one month old. Where's my buddy that's on Apalutamide? Are you here today? How's it working t this month? Boy, that's what I've had to do. Boy, are you tired? Could you help me hold this? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, apalutamide, uh, brand name uh, uh, Erlita, and uh, uh, just came out. I started last month, and boy, it uh, has a high side effect of fatigue. I am kind of a hyperactive guy. so really slowed me down. And uh, I don't have the energy I used to, so I need to, to relax some. I can't sleep, but after I relax a bit, I get that energy back. But uh, I hope it's a sign that it's working. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a powerhouse stuff, and uh, you get a rash? Not yet. Okay, well, I learned that 25% uh, of us get the rash. I have not got the rash. I get the itch, though, and so forth. So uh, hopefully, I'm feeling better this week. Last week was, was uh, slowed me down quite a bit, but uh, I feel much better. Uh, recurrence, how many of you had after the first treatment have it come back? Yeah, that's the thing with prostate cancer. That's why you need to keep doing a, a PSA. How many are undecided what to do next? They, it's, uh, these answers aren't uh, necessarily very, very apparent. That's why you do need to talk to your doctor. And one of the critical things that, for, for example, for me, are the side effects. I get all the side effects. I'm Swedish. I get all the side I get diarrhea and constipation at the same time. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, 
so I, I get them. Uh, well, others, I, I've done a little study. On, if you're Italian, you have no problems, okay? <laughs> but, but Swedes and maybe some Norwegians have a problem. And, uh, but that's a key factor to consider. That's the quality of life. It's a key factor, and doctors not, tend not to tell you about what this, these treatments can do to you. And uh, some very severe, more than just diarrhea. Okay, we need your support. This is not a free program. We got expenses. This is where we're going to pass the baskets. And uh, now we got small baskets, so we're looking for big bills. If we're going to break even and, and continue, we need an average of uh, 10 bucks a person. So pass the baskets uh, and let you pass them down the aisle, down the, down the row. There we go. Okay. Uh, do, bills with zeros on it are really appreciated, uh, in case you wonder. And we're, we're tax exempt, so uh, if you need a receipt for that, let us know. We're not affiliated with any religious or uh, uh, medical organization. And uh, we're a 501c3. We're official. All right, just as we're passing the basket, uh, I want to remind you, we have six steps in our program. Uh, the first is get early detection of PSA. Ignore the task force report that doesn't want you to get one, particularly if you're uh, uh, 55 or younger. Uh, if you have prostate cancer and you have a son who's 55 and younger, tell him to get a PSA because the probabilities are much higher that he's going to have prostate cancer than the normal one out of six. Uh, get that test. Ask for it. Uh, don't do what I did, ignored it, and not had it. My first one was when I was uh, uh, 65, and it was already at 15. And then get it again, because it may come back. Uh, do high-definition diagnostics. We'll hear some more about that uh, uh, next month. Uh, and we're going to hear something about uh, using uh, high-definition diagnostics for, uh, for targeting, targeting your, your uh, uh, prostate for the, uh, the tumor cell. Uh, rather than the, what we call random, and they call it systematic. That's where they put 12 needles in you and, and a, a sequential grid, it may or may not be uh, hitting the primary tumor. Know your Gleason story after you've had a biopsy, because that's key to what the next step is, what kind of treatment you should have. And if your Gleason is high, uh, that, that's the key to determine what type works. If it's low, you may not even need treatment. And uh, so that treatment selection, you could have also active surveillance, or, or it's a factor in treatment selection. I forgot to mention here two things. Don't, we don't want to interrupt our, our speaker. Uh, one is shut off your cell phone. And uh, if you want to leave it on, you're free to, but one of the rules at one of the support groups, you have to stand up and loudly mention your name. And, and tell where you are, that you're in the informed prostate cancer support group. Say that's, uh, otherwise, please shut off your cell phone. And then we have facilities. Now, our doctor uh, is aware of why you need to go to uh, uh, the facilities, and they're out in the back, down the hall. And uh, so that's where those things are located. And now today's agenda. And uh, Jean would like to say a few words before I introduce our speaker. Thank you. This work is this on? Can you hear me okay? I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, uh, we sent out with a meeting notice yesterday uh, a notice that uh, about the metastatic prostate cancer project. If you didn't notice it, go back and look at the uh, uh, email that came out. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's trying to collect information together. Uh, what 
all the treatments you have and what it's done leading itself towards genetic testing that will decide what kind of treatments you need. And that is just absolutely what's going to make our life much better over a long time. Uh, I just personally, uh, as many of you know, have had almost every kind of treatment there is except chemo now. Um, <clears throat> there's now a new test that I just did blood work for it uh, called APV7. And, and uh, we sent uh, a blood test in to find out if I can handle Zytiga. Zytiga is one of the few drugs I have not taken because I decided to take Xtandi when those both came out. So now we'll find out whether I can withstand that treatment or it will be effective for me. That's what we're headed for. So if you didn't notice that or read about it, uh, you send the information in and it becomes a, a anonymous that they're not tracing you as a person, but rather uh, what, what uh, treatments you've done, what medications you've had, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, <clears throat> another quick note, uh, many of us, and I do it, have done it quite often, is the F8, F18 sodium fluoride scan. Many of you may know that it was uh, in December discontinued as payment by the uh, uh, <clears throat> federal guys. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, they still do it. I just had one done last week. Uh, they still do it at imaging healthcare specialists, but there's a fee associated with it, 1400 bucks. Uh, and, but I've used it for many years to track what's going on inside to find out when and if uh, metastasis is developing. That's the purpose of it for me, anyhow. Um, I just want to make a quick note here. I want to introduce somebody as probably the p person that has come the farthest ever to come to one of our meetings. His name is Clark Scarborough and is visiting, uh, visiting us from Thailand. He's, he's over here. He, uh, Reason I know Clark is uh, I've, for many years, I communicated with a support group in, in Houston. We exchanged information and so forth. And Clark at that time was a member of that group. And uh, he since has uh, moved to Thailand and has become teach, a teacher of sorts. I don't know teaching what. Uh, but he had cryoablation done two years ago? Yes. Okay. Uh, so any of you guys that have thought about that and want to talk to Clark, catch up with him after the meeting and talk to him a little bit. But thanks for coming in, Clark. It's good to see you here. All right. Okay. Okay. So that's it for me. Do something useful, George. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the focus of the meeting is on focal therapy. This is the new wave, rather than just taking out the whole mass or radiating the whole area, a focal is the new way of treating a prostate cancer. So we're going to hear about one of the techniques of focal therapy from uh, the, uh, the only person that I know of in the San Diego area that, uh, that does the, the nano knife. Uh, it's, uh, it's done elsewhere at, uh, at uh, some of the, the best uh, research centers, but it's new to this area, so you're going to hear about that. Uh, we tend to know uh, Dr. Ross uh, Schwartzberg from the standpoint of what he does with the MRI at the Imaging Healthcare Center. Uh, they got a, the Super Duper 3 Tesla high definition, and that's where I've got to know him. And, uh, and he's, he's one of these special guys that sits down with you and talks to you about what he sees and what what uh, what all, all means. So he's a special friend for me. But now he's, he's wearing a different hat today, talking about treatment. And uh, and uh, his his background is University of Arizona Medical School, and then uh, he did his residency up at uh, University of California San Francisco, and then went to Stanford University for radiology and then neuroradiology. And so uh, he knows what he's talking about. But also what he is, he's a, he's a uh, high school baseball umpire. And so uh, when I visit him at the end of my, my visit, he goes, <laughs> instead of. 
So let's play ball, okay? philosophical kind of discussion about why we're doing this, why we're suggesting there's another way than the traditional types of treatments. Um, and, um, you know, the science is in there and I can direct you to where to get the numbers and the background and everything, but it's going to be a little bit of a different type of discussion. Importantly, my uh, partner and uh, Dr. James Cooper is here. And he's an essential part of our program. <laughs> I'm also happy to say that the uh, CEO of my imaging company, Doc, uh, Imaging Healthcare, Stan Locke, came just as a sign of support. Uh, we couldn't be doing what we're doing without the incredible uh, MRI, uh, 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 which is a key part of the whole uh, diagnostic and treatment pathway now. And I'm gonna actually, it's always bad to, to start blaming somebody at the start of a talk, but I'm gonna blame Gene because I was supposed to have this on a, a keynote presentation, but we're doing it on a PowerPoint, but it's gonna work out, it's gonna work out fine, so. So, unfortunately, the, uh, I don't, the, um, oh, already we're having this. Let's see, trouble here. Okay, so this is just a, this is a picture of uh, an illustration that you can see the electrodes surrounding the, the tumor. You can have a blood vessel running by it. The technology spares the blood vessels. I had a cute little um, uh, thing where the pig would fly in and we'd play some music and the, there's a double meaning to the pig situation. Uh, you know, when pigs fly is used as a phrase to kind of mock the idea that something could work. Um, and also, in experiments, when we start, when the, the guys who were developing IRE started to turn on the occurrence, the test pigs went flying off the table. So this really is a uh, technology that makes pigs fly, and we're gonna, I think it's also going to be a, a helpful option for patients in treating cancer. So the very first day, the very first patient we treated, we're in the OR. And then one of my, our colleague doctors barged into the OR and said, who are you? What the heck are you doing here? What is that? And I actually like direct combative people because that's kind of the way I am sometimes. So who we are, I'm a, I'm, I'm a diagnostic radiologist. I've spent my life looking at, at, at pictures and um, when my son was yet little, he used to sit on my lap and go, oh, daddy, look at the twisters. I don't know why he called things twisters, and it was so cute. And over the years, he got smart. He goes, you know, dad, I finally figured out what you do. You look at pictures, you figure out what's normal, and then when you see something abnormal, you call somebody that knows what the heck they're doing to do something about it. <laughs> but okay, well, that's pretty fair. Well, now I'm that guy that's going to do something about it as well. Dr. Cooper, uh, an essential part of our program, and his, and his um, George said, I really got into this because of my interest in the imaging, um, and imaging is essential to what we're doing and essential really to the whole diagnostic um, and treatment pathway. So that's who we are. What, what is that? Well, it's uh, Nano Knife is the trade name. The, the, the technology is irreversible electroporation. Um, it's not as complicated as it sounds. Irreversible, you can't go back. Uh, electro refers to the electric energy, so this is an electrical energy. Poration, the electrical energy interacting with the carbon-based molecules um, pokes holes in the cell membrane, and that's how the cells die. So that's what, that's what it is. Um, and what are we doing? We're, we're um, removing cancer, killing cellular tissue using this principle of um, electrical energy and how it interacts with the cell membrane. So our basic proposition is that um, it's reasonable to offer a different pathway than traditional treatment pathway, meaning 
as George mentioned, for years and years, uh, whole gland therapy, specifically radical prostatectomy, was the way to go. Uh, our proposition is that there's tremendous value in, instead of treating the whole gland, treating the cancer, treating the identifiable tumor. Simply speaking, when you take out the whole gland, there are whole gland functions, critical genitourinary functions that certainly you guys all know about that get injured at a significant degree when you take out the whole gland. So the concept of treating the tumor instead of the whole gland intuitively makes sense. And really, it's, it's, um, it's a reform that's kind of in a, cons a conservative reform. Instead of storming the Bastille and turning things upside down, we're actually saying maybe you don't always have to do radical treatment. Maybe you can do conservative treatment. And if you can see the tumor, treat the tumor. So this is, um, let's see if this works here. Oh, good. So on the left is Mark Emberton, a urologist at University College London. And the other guy is Noel something. He's also a urologist. And Mark Emberton is one of the world's leaders in focal therapy and a big proponent. And they had a debate, and this is online, um, this, their little discussion. And Dr. Emberton gave an incredibly well thought out, logical discussion, humble about what we're doing and uh, what the focal therapy is about, and, the, and said, you know, he took kind of an extreme standpoint, which is just standard of care should be focal therapy when you have a target, an identifiable uh, lesion. We're not going that far, but certainly the concept of offering it is certainly it is reasonable. So um, the next guy came up and said, you know, I've known Mark for many, many years, and he's a great guy, um, but we've got a difference, and I, I think he looks like Mar uh, Austin Powers, and the other guy looks kind of like Control from the Austin Powers movie. But anyway, right away, this guy just, just launched in on Mark Emerton, and <laughs> I, I mean, he brought this slide up. And he said, you know, Mark's a good guy, but the data is kind of, it's all, made. I mean, it's, he just tore this guy apart. Uh, and, and the point being, when you do try to say, let's do something a little different, it, you sometimes get this response. And it's important for us to know that that is out there, that there are many urologists who thinks it's absolutely crazy to offer a different kind of treatment. Um, and we need to be aware of that. So I don't know if anybody knows Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who was an early 20th century British guy who wrote some incredibly great stuff. And he, the Chesterton's fence, he made a he discussion about if you're going to offer a different way, if, if you're going to do something different, if you're going to offer a reform, you, you, you better know why certain, a thing was done that way in the first place. So if you're going to knock down a fence, why is the fence there? And I, I strongly believe that's true. Before we're going to say, let's do something a little different, let's be certain we understand how we got to where we are. And it's a fascinating history. Uh, you guys probably are starting to figure it out. It's a fascinating history how dramatically prostate cancer has changed as far as uh, 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 incidence of the disease, how we understand it, how we treat it. Um, and it's also important to understand that we are standing on the shoulders of giants who have made seminal um, contributions to the field. On the left is Charles, Charles Huggins, who was the guy that first under, discovered that uh, androgens and prostate have a relationship, um, ultimately leading to the first systemic therapy for cancer of any kind, i.e. androgen deprivation therapy profoundly helpful, yet as we've evolved, we've discovered that nothing's for free and there are certainly dif difficulties with prolonged androgen therapy. The next guy is Andrew Shall. Oh, by the way, Huggins won a Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1966 for his work. The next guy is Andrew Shalley. He's um, a PhD who discovered and synthesized luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone. So all the... Uh, um, he won the Nobel Prize in 1977. The next guy is Patrick Walsh, who is a famous uh, urologist at um, uh, Johns Hopkins, essentially 
invented nerve-sparing radical prostatectomy, 1983. The next guy is kind of, I've got a connection to Malcolm Bagshaw at, at Stanford, from Stanford. It was the head of radiology, radiation oncologist, essentially established the protocols for um, the radiation of the prostate. Parenthetically, I just want to mention that just as focal therapy is kind of regarded as a little out there, surgeons regarded radiation of the prostate as questionable as well. So it's not just our therapy that's kind of looked on with circumspection. Uh, uh, other, th other new therapies have been looked on the same way. Um, Gerald Murphy, I forget what he's did, but it was something important. But uh, <laughs> I think he did um, something with chemotherapy. I apologize. Uh, my notes. So, um, interesting guy, Tool Gawande from Brigham and Women, writing about the history of surgery and how far we've come, but he uses some pretty, pretty, pretty uh, strong language about how brutal surgery can be and what it was like in the past. But we certainly made tremendous uh, strides. I mean, if you look at um, laparoscopic surgery, I remember I was in training when that came out. It was considered to be another crazy idea. And now pretty much everything, or many, most things are done laparoscopically. Of course, then you're not, we're now the days of robots and Da Vinci and whether Da Vinci adds value or not is debated, but certainly um, we're moving in that direction and constantly evolving. This is an article Patrick Walsh wrote in 1983 when he discovered with doing some unfortunately dissections on stillborn babies, the, the cavernous and pudendal nerves and how to approach the prostate to best spare those nerves. So it's all a, um, it's all a progression. Things are not staying the same. And prostate cancer is dramatically changing and really at a faster pace, it seems. So a good one day basically says if, if uh, we're moving from minimally invasive procedures you know, maybe we're going to come to the day where you, you get to the elimination of invasion. But right now, we certainly are in a stage where minimally invasive seems to make sense intuitively, and the data is pointing that way. Patrick Walsh himself said, you know, this is in 2008. The problem we have with the prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment is that we, we can't see the tumor in the gland. So if you think about how the standard diagnosis was, the PSA going to biopsy, blind biopsy, random systematic, whatever you want to call it, uh, you knew you were in the prostate, but you didn't know anything else. You didn't know it was normal from abnormal. You just randomly took samples. That led to all sorts of problems, overdiagnosis, and inconsequential cancers, missing consequential cancers, downstream harms. That's a whole other discussion. The problem was that we didn't have a way to look at the gland before we started sticking needles in. Well, those days are over. And I call it the big four. So for years, guys like me have been going around giving talks about prostate MR makes sense. Here's the picture of the prostate. Here's the cancer. You know, here's the guys had six biopsies and the guy came back negative and here's the MRI with the anterior cancer. And everybody shook their heads, and the urologists, you know, yeah, and they went on and did the things their, their same way. 2014, a huge level one prospective study showing MR was the way to go. 2015, this is from the NIH, Peter Pinto, the chief of urology, NIH, prostate MR is the way to go. Promise study, 2017, Hashim Ahmed and Emberton, University College London, Level one randomized control study, prostate MRI is the way to go. Every time, you, Scott Egner at the University of Chicago, when we saw him earlier last year, when we asked about this, he goes, well, I'm still not convinced. We need more data. So, okay, Scott Egner's on this paper, this last one. Came out just, uh, I have it somewhere. Came out last month, no, this month, in the New England Journal of Medicine. There is, can now be no more debate there is no more debate. If you have an elevated PSA, before you go to a biopsy, you, ha you should have an MRI. And so unless somebody can give you some compelling evidence, 
that goes against everything scientifically and everything intuitively, you should look before you poke. So that, um, that's, um, and this is an example, this is not a, this is a prostate here, um, colorized diffusion image overlying the T2 image, and there's a big tumor there. There it is. This is a guy that had three, I don't know how they missed it, they missed his, his cancer three separate times. He came to us, we see the cancer, we can tell you where to stick the needle, we can do it ourselves, or I can tell him exactly where to stick the needle. You don't have to do 15 other areas, you're not gonna get any significant cancer. And here's the thing, if you can do, find that cancer, you can localize it, you can target it for biopsy, what about targeting it for treatment? That seems to make sense, and we'll talk about that. Um, speaking of um, Nobel Prizes, these are the two guys, Paul Lauterbur and, on the left and Peter Mansfield on the right, who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2003 for the development of MRI. Um, and Peter Mansfield we have a connection to with, through Dr. Snelling. So, Many of you guys have had something very much like this. Young guy, is the PSA is up. 8.7 is of concern, even uh, although there's one piece of information we don't know based on this is what's the size of the prostate. If any of you have not heard the term PSA density, you should learn PS, what PSA density is. It's it basically PSA density is taking your PSA value and dividing it by the size of your prostate and 0.15 is considered to be worrisome above that. The point being, I might have a 20 cc uh, prostate size and Cooper might have 150 cc, because he's a real man and I'm just, but, but um, you know, and so a PSA of four is not the same for me as it is for him. So this is what used to happen. This is what used to happen and should not happen anymore. You should not randomly go in and get a biopsy. I, I was used to be very hesitant about saying that. I didn't want to upset anybody. But with the latest paper, it, 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 I'm going to go on to say it. it is, you should absolutely have an MR before you go to biopsy. Let's see, where do we go now? All right, we already talked about that. So... All of that leads to this, this, all of this diagnostic stuff that we've been doing, it's a new pathway, it's a seed change in how prostate cancer is managed from the diagnosis to the treatment. So instead of guessing on clinical stage and then upgrading on the pathological stage, we now have a very precise way of locally staging before treatment starts. We can tell where cancer is, we can tell the volume of the cancer, we can discuss the, the risk stratifications, um, and tell a guy, you know, the natural history of your disease is likely to be this based on everything we know, uh, and um, instead of just guessing and waiting until after the, the, you take it out and look on the, on the slab, you, you, then you say, oh, by the way, it was it spread outside the capsule and maybe it wasn't a huge benefit to give you the surgery in the first place. So this is why it's paramount importance to look at before you, you do these uh, biopsies. So Emberton says this in one of his discussions, and, and I believe it's true, focal therapy with a high quality system of care, imaging, targeted biopsy, energy man management registries are a, a part of routine care. I, I believe that this is an option that is very much worth considering in, for many, many men. Um, we do have an integrated system here. We have the, we're dedicated to the best imaging hospital. We are doing targeted biopsies. You can do that in bore, which we do, or you can do it through MR fusion, which we now do with our partners at Genesis. Many of you have Genesis urologist doctors. We're now tightly integrated with them. They take our data from the MR. They plug it into their ultrasound. So when they're doing their ultrasound, they can see the MRI and they can, they can direct their needle into the target I've detected on the MR. So how you do the targeted biopsy is an interesting discussion, but targeted biopsy should be the way things are performed. Energy management refers to the types of ablation 
energies. One of the gentlemen here has had cryoablation. Um, there's large literature on that. It's a thermal-based energy. We have a non-thermal-based energy. Which energy is better? That's another discussion, but certainly it's uh, worth thinking about. And we, we're, we um, you need to follow the patients. One of the things we don't know, because this is new, is what happens in 20 years. So we have to keep track of all the patients. All of our patients are part of an NCI um, trial and will be followed for their, their career. Um, electroporation, it's been around for quite a while. Uh, medical applications are, are newer. There was in the lab, um, reverse electroporation has been used to place genes into, into cells for many years. So scientists have been familiar with this, um, but from a medical, Clinical standpoint is relatively new. Um, it's all about the cell membrane, the bilipid plasma membrane of the cell and how the electrical energy interacts with that. This gives, I don't know if you ever saw this movie, Weird Science. Is that, this guy, I, I think he kind of looks like me. I don't know. But um, so there is real science, and as I alluded to briefly in the beginning, Dr. Stelling and our physicists can go on and on. I know many of you guys in here are engineers and, and um, you know, we can talk about it if you want to some other time, but it's just too complex. Let's, just, let's, let's stipulate that there's real science and we can direct you to the articles on our website and how this actually works. A, a molecular dynamics, a, a nice illustration of how the the, the biphosphate lipid membranes are oriented a certain way, and then when you put the electrical pulse on, they, they change the orientation and form these holes. Uh, I think this is actually quite a fascinating slide, which is a, um, from our group. This is uh, nanopores. Uh, you can see with electron microscopy the actual holes that the electric energy is uh, making in the cell. So it was theoretical, and now we, you know, we actually have experiments that show the, the, how the, the cells are forming, the holes are forming. Um, uh, again, I don't want to go really too deep into all this stuff, other than to say the essential key point here is that how the cell dies is different from the other types of energies. So when you have a heat energy, whether it be um, laser, or uh, HIFU, or you have a cold energy like cryo, there's, the way the cell dies is a process called coagulative necrosis. Uh, the way the cell dies with this is called apoptosis. What, that's, a, that's a medical term for when the normal homeostasis, when the cell membrane breaks, breaks down, the outside comes in, the inside goes out, all sorts of crazy things between the mitochondria and the endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum and all this stuff happens. And the cell signaling turns on the auto kill button. Literally, there's this, there's, and the, the cell will crumble. The key, the, the key point is the technology we use and the electrical energy does not kill the surrounding non-cellular support structure. As opposed to the other ablation technologies, everything in the path of the energy will be destroyed. With IRE, the non-cellular tissue is preserved. And here's an illustration of that, um, kind of a clumsy, but you know, showing the green representing the cells and the little squiggly lines representing matrix um, collagen proteins. You do IRE and all that non-cellular stuff is preserved. Um, this fascinating phenomenon of how even the smooth blood, the smooth blood, uh, muscles within the cells are damaged, yet endothelial cells regenerate on the cell so that the blood vessels are preserved. And we believe this is why there's such a low incidence of um, damage to erectile function and to the uh, external sphincter. And again, this is different than the other ablation technologies. That's an, a, little, a little picture showing how uh, within the ablation field, this is an animal model, the blood vessel and the nerves are preserved. 
And again, clinically, this correlates with a very, very low rate of damage to these uh, functions. So this is what the machine looks like. Uh, it's an electrical generator, capacitor attached to computer with all the software plugged in. Um, the electrodes actually had show and tell. I brought some electrodes. So afterwards, we'll do some show and tell if you want. Um, the electrodes hooked up to the generator and then um, with the, uh, placed into the, through the skin of the perineum. This is the output we see on a nano knife machine. We have to label each electrode geometrically where it is. Um, the, the computer decides which is the cathode, which is the anode. Um, we can select the voltage and the pulse length and the number of pulses, which results in a certain um, current, ampers, and we know how much we can give, and so we can adjust these parameters. Um, and uh, <laughs> So key question number one, you know, is it safe? I thought this was interesting. Oh, no. Oh, I, at my my um, movies aren't playing with this, but did you ever see Marathon Man? Do you remember that movie? So Lawrence Olivier asking, asking Dustin Hoff, is it safe? And he first, and it progressively gets more disgusting after. Anyway, it's safe is the point. This is safe. We, uh, Stelling has treated over 700 guys. Um, and again, the data, uh, one guy developed a rectal fistula, which healed out on its own. Um, very, very, very low risk profile. Adver adverse events related to the, the procedure, minimal, essentially related to the catheter that stays in. So it's a safe procedure. Uh, this, I don't know if this will play either. Um, this is a, a movie um, that Nano Knife Angiodynamics puts on, and it shows real, like a movie, 3D you know, how the electrodes are put in and how the ablation zones are formed in between each of the electro, uh, electrode pairs. And so the procedure is an outpatient procedure. It's done in a, a, a surgery center. And the reason being the electrical pulses cause muscle contraction. And that requires deep paralysis and that requires general intratracheal anesthesia. So we have to put the patient to sleep. Um, and we're using the 3D planning is based on our preoperative MRI, which I'll show. And the in, the in procedure is based on ultrasound fused with the MR. So we are sitting in, between, in front of the patient. We have our monitor here. We're looking real time as the, the needles are going in. We have an MR overlay and on another monitor. We know exactly where we want to put the needles, and we spend as much time as we have to to get the electrodes in the right place. Oh, darn it. Okay, this is... Oh, so this is kind of good. This is plain. So you can... This is a sagittal image. This, this is the transducer. So here's the rectum. This, this echogenic line is one of the electrodes. You can see how the... The movement, that is the, even with the deep paralysis, when we turn the electro, the, uh, the, 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 we turn on the, the generator, it causes pretty, pretty pronounced contractions. That's why, if you notice here, we don't have a grid. Sorry for the picture, but this, I'm showing what we're doing. We don't have a grid. We don't want a grid because when the patient's moving like this, if you have a grid, meaning a fixed thing between the patient and where the electrodes are going in through the grid, it changes, it, get, it introduces a degree of error that we don't want. We're shooting for one to two millimeter precision. We want to get within one to two millimeters of our optimal electrode placement. And if you have a grid in, as the patient's moving, the grid is fixed, the electrodes are fixed, and you're introducing uh, an error that we don't want. So we don't do uh, using a grid we are the only group that I know of that does that way. It makes it a, uh, more time intensive, but we will sp we're willing to spend as much time as necessary to get the best result. The key of all this is if you're going to do focal therapy, minimally invasive therapy, you need a target. And so we need to get the best picture possible. 
uh, this is an example of the type of MR we're looking for, we want to get. This is a coronal image. The prostate is characteristically kind of pear-shaped or even heart-shaped in this case. So down by the bottom, what's called the apex, it's, it's narrower up by the top, the brace, it's, it's, it's broader. And he, you don't have to be an imaging expert to see this looks different than the rest of the, the gland. And this is, with all my different fancy parameters, I know that this is a, the cancer. This is just some scar tissue, prior inflammation. We can prove this is a cancer, and we still have to with a targeted biopsy. James is now a pro in, 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 in using MR to precisely put our needle in and document that it's in the worst part of that cancer. Um, so that's what we want, and that's what we need. There are times, what about when you don't get a picture like this? And believe me, I, not every patient looks like this. There's technical parameters that can be, meaning um, uh, bowel motion can cause difficulty for MRI, the diffusion sequence particularly. Um, patient who's had prior inflammation or scarring, sometimes the overlap between benign non-cancer inflammation and cancer is kind of close and we can't really tell. So in those cases, there is a discussion about um, what's the next best thing you can do. And the next best thing you can do is called a 3D template mapping biopsy, which is not something, in fact, we've never done it here. Uh, Stelling has done some in Germany. Uh, so if you can't really tell with confidence where the cancer is, what's the spatial distribution with MR, you can do this mapping biopsy. And I don't know if this is going to show. Okay, yeah. The movie's not showing. So this was another movie showing that in this case, we do use the grid. The grid is 2.5 millimeters apart. And you put a biopsy needle every 2.5 millimeters throughout the entire prostate. That is obviously not our first choice. And, and we have not done it, but there are certain cases that um, it's certainly part of the discussion if you don't get the, that top quality MRI I talked about. Um, this group is fantastic for all the reasons that George was discussing. And I'm a big proponent of the, you're, you, you've got to be your own advocate. I think our role, my role as a doctor, and I think it should be the role of all the doctors, is to, is to help you understand what's going on in your situation. Um, uh, and and I, 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 that's why I'm so committed to the imaging part, because I think the imaging part is paramount to all of this. Um, but ultimately, what's right for one guy might not be right for the next guy. So I don't think, I should say, you know, focal therapy is the way to go every single patient every time. I think it might be the, a good approach for some of you guys, one of you guys. But the key is to give you the right information. If you, you're all familiar, the book, familiar with the book Invasion of the Body Sna uh, Prostate Snatchers, right, Mark Scholes? You know, he just came out with a new book. I just started reading it. It's called The Key to Prostate Cancer, I think. Yeah, I tell you, unbelievable. I just started. Um, so I highly recommend any of you guys to get that book. Um, I learned a tremendous amount from it, just like I learned a tremendous amount from interacting with you guys and coming to these meetings. Um, and this is stolen from Mark Schultz. He calls it stage of blue. So when I see a patient, we're discussing what to, you know, what's going on. The key for me, the key thing is to get all get all the information so I can uh, discuss with the patient you know, what specific type of cancer do you have? And, and Mark calls it stages of blue, um, and that's in his new book. And uh, there's different ways of slicing up prostate cancer. We all know about Gleason score, PSA, um, uh, percentage of cancer in the core, which is a parametric for volume, which is really what MR shows us is the volume. Um, putting all that stuff together, you can then look at these different risk stratifications, Diamico, UCSF Capra, NCCN, and figure out where you fall and what the natural history of your cancer is. My, I'm probably most satisfied with a guy, when a guy comes to me 
and he has a good quality MRI, he has a targeted biopsy, and he's got a tiny volume three plus three. Now, three plus three, Gleason six. And a lot of guys raised their hands when we said, who's on active surveillance? Um, I, my job in a situation like that is to reassure the, the gentleman that he, he should be followed. Treatment is not really the best option for him. And, you know, of course we understand that when you hear the word cancer, all sorts of things run through your head, and it's very common to want to get, take care of it, but it's dangerous to always assume that doing something is better than nothing. Actor surveillance is not doing nothing. Actor surveillance is following things closely and making sure. And my job, I had a guy recently who came from Maryland and was being seen at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and somehow he came out to see me, and, and, and he really wanted something done. And I said, well, you don't really need anything done. It's, and, and so that's what our job as doctors should be, is to get you guys to understand what's going on with you. Um, so I think I have every patient we see, we go through this. And I'm sure you've probably seen this. The, um, this is the Han table, because the question comes up, our main thrust with focal therapy is preserving the gland, preserving gland functions, quality of life. The other side of the equation is cancer control. The de default notion has always been that the radical treatment is, of course, the best way to deal with can cancer control. I'm not going to say it is or is not, but I will say that you can go online to the Johns Hopkins website and look at the pond tables and plug in your data and get uh, a result which shows that cancer comes, prostate cancer comes back. That we all know that. It comes back even after the most radical treatment. Even when it looks like the cancer is completely localized with the gland, gland the cancer can come back. Now, there's different, uh, when I say cancer, you can have biochemical recurrence is different than getting metastases. Um, but the point being, as illustrated by guys raising the hand who have been treated and who have been retreated, prostate cancer is a chronic disease that should be managed smartly because it tends to come back. So I show the patients this when they say, what are the chances the cancer could come back with your treatment? I say, well, I, can't, I cannot promise the cancer is not going to come back or biochemical recurrence or, or a, a, a localized recurrence, just like um, Mies Habhan and Patrick Walsh can't promise the cancer is not going to come back after radical prostatectomy. What we are able to say is that the cancer control rate is tracking very similar with, our, with focal therapy in general, we have, uh, in our five, six years of follow-up, about 20% recurrence, all comers, all stages. If we extrapolate the data onto the HIFU and the cryo that have been out longer, um, the cancer recurrence rates for the focal therapies seem very similar to the most radical therapies. And, and that's, we discuss that with the, every patient. So quality of life issues, this is standard published data on a, that, you know, the, the, tr the radical treatment it comes with downsides. And this is, I can't really understand this, so I've made it simpler. You know, this was that major paper, two years, five years, 15 years. You're gonna have some, you're gonna have some, um, uh, you may have some problems with genital urinary functions, potency, and incontinence. At a particularly, somewhat shockingly high levels. And this is in the best hands. Now, certain, institutions and doctors say, well, I can do better than that. I don't know if they can or not. You guys have to decide for yourselves, but certainly it's not a secret that there are downstream side effects to radical treatment. One of my talks is kind of arguing from reverse, the reasons not to do focal therapy. And this, this is kind of shocking that somebody even says this. <laughs> and there is some urologists who believe that, you know, it's, if you need treatment, get it out and take it out. It's the best treatment and just deal with the side effects. Um, and this is a paper. We all kind of know that we don't necessarily want to deal with these side effects, but actually in the journals, they always find incredible things to write about. So they actually did a study looking at 
how, what guys felt about these side effects. And the question was how much life um, extension do they want to deal with these certain side effects? So to deal with severe urinary leakage, it was about 30 months of extra extended life. The, the point being, um, you don't want to, if, if there's another option, if there's another option, you, you, you know, makes sense intuitively to perhaps pursue the option that's going to preserve your quality of life. Um, I'm going to kind of, I briefly touched on thermal versus non-thermal. Um, that's the cold miser, if you remember the cold miser and the heat miser. We're no miser. We, we are non-thermal. Non There's advantages to it. Um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, move a little faster through this. Uh, I gave a talk at the RSNA on treatment recurrent prostate cancer with using our technology. This is one of the slides I used. Um, obviously, there's major advantages to a minimally invasive technique as far as surgical stay, pain control, et cetera. Uh, we briefly talked about cancer coming back. Uh, this is one of the cases that we talked about at the RSNA, a patient who had had prior HIFU with the recurrence here, and we, we Stelling did this, was able to use IRE as a salvage treatment. Um, now, some of you may or may not understand this slide. Uh, does anybody notice, besides Dan Locke, who these people are? Woody Hayes and Archie Griffin. And um, so Archie Griffin won the Heisman Trophy in 1975. And Woody Hayes called him in before the seven, no, 74, take it back, 74. And Woody Hayes called him in before the season and said, Archie, I want to just remind you something. You're either getting, going forward or going backward. You're never staying the same. So Archie Griffin walked out of the room and goes, what is that about? And then he realized Woody Hayes was saying he had to win the Heisman again, otherwise he'd be going backwards. <laughs> so he won the Heisman for the second two times, two years in a row, only guy ever to do that. Um, the point being that, as I've hopefully shown, understanding of prostate cancer is evolving dynamically. Uh, the treat, how we're diagnosing it is evolving dramatically. The options for treatment are evolving dramatically. And um, I think focal therapy is a good option in certain cases. I, I we're willing to take the slings and arrows from, um, from the guys who are used to the conventional treatments because we think it's of such value. And, and um, I'm just going to finish with um, and, and the point was, it was the Star Trek where they come back in time to Earth in the 20th century, and Chekhov falls and, her, and has a head injury. And they take him into um, a doc, to a hospital, and he's got what calls, he's got an epidural hematoma, which is bleeding around the, uh, between the skull and the surface of the brain. And, it'll, and if you don't take care of it, you die. And they were just about to crack his skull. The guy had a drill, and Bones walks in and, and says, what the heck are you doing? And he uses this little, whatever, tricorder. And, and the point he says, he talks, oh, you know, don't be so brutal, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the point being um, that I have one last slide here, um, is that we're evolving. And, and the first slide said if we're, we're moving from, in, from uh, surgery to minimally invasive, the next, the next frontier will be the elimination of invasion at all. So we will probably in 10 years or so have cellular treatments completely. And it'll probably be, you know, immune system augmentation. This, uh, this is a guy named Steven Rosenberg, who's at the National Cancer Institute. And actually, I believe it or not, spent some time with him. I did a year of research after medical school and worked in his, his lab. Um, and if you look real closely behind him, right? 
actually, I'm not anywhere in the picture anywhere. But I did work with him, and the point being that we will move on from minimally invasive to cellular level treatments, and uh, thank you for your, your attention. All right, now we're going to open it up for questions, and then we're going to scan the audience. We'll start over here, and then move over there, and then come back. And uh, come on up here. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and then we're going to ask you, too, if, when you hear the question, would you repeat the question so, so we can all hear that, or that part of the question you want to answer? If you don't want to answer, don't repeat it, okay? So here we go. Let's start down here with a question. And uh, all right. Does electrical electroporation work on a solitary metastatic bone lesion? So um, the, the question is electroporation for a solitary metastatic bone lesion. And the answer is, the, um, the, main, uh, the main advantage of electroporation is that it, it, it's, it spares the surrounding structures, so it's got a lower risk profile. In the bone, um, it, 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 the type of energy is not that important in the sense that cryotherapy, for instance, will equally as well kill the, the metastasis or remove the metastasis. Um, but it's probably much more efficient to use either, uh, at least now, cryo or one of these other types of energies because the, the IRE requires general anesthesia and it's quite a, a big to-do. So, of course, IRE absolutely can be used for bone lesions. Um, it can be used in pancreas and liver. It can be used for lymph nodes, but it, it's not really... Um, it doesn't distinguish itself in the bone as much as it does in these other areas where you're more likely to damage surrounding structures with the other energies. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, second question is, at, at what stage of prostatic cancer is electrical uh, electroporation uh, uh, most beneficial? The question is, at what stage of cancer, is electroporation most beneficial? Um, so initially, um, I, all the focal therapies were thought best to be reserved for early, low-grade or intermediate-grade disease. However, we've taken a different approach in the sense that if a man is 56 years old and has a 4 plus 3 and the convention and the Guidelines say that you sh maybe should have surgery and then you should have salvage radiation and then you should have hormones or some combination. Some guys just don't want to face that. And based on what I showed with cancer control, we do offer, after long discussion, folk, uh, our treatment, if it's an index lesion we can identify, we offer treatment to men at all stages. So and, uh, we've t treated men with salvage after they've recurred from another cancer. Uh, we've treated um, intermediate gr disease, and we've treated guys with high-grade disease. We will not treat a guy with 3 plus 3 that's isolated low volume 3 plus 3, because I don't believe they should be treated, even if you can. Question here. <laughs> so it sounds like from what you hear last answer here, uh, 3 plus 3 cancer you can treat if it's widespread. So, three, uh, if you have, I'll take that two ways. Let's say 3 plus 3 um, insignificant cancer, low, low risk cancer, there's different definitions, um, and volume is one of them. So, in other words, 3 plus 3 small in a certain volume, there's debate on what that volume is. It's not uncommon now for us to see large lesions, meaning the CC or more on MR, that come back even with directed biopsy 3 plus 3. And if you talk to guys around the world, like um, Emberton on Med, there's, not, there's discomfort with not treating a high volume 3 plus 3. So if a guy has a focal 3 plus 3 that's high volume, and particularly has a high PSA density, we worry about that. Um, 
so that would be a patient we definitely consider treatment. If you're saying three plus three in multiple different spots throughout the gland, that's a little harder because then you get into um, what kind of ablation zone would we create, uh, you know, and it might not be the right setting for a focal directed. We have done whole gland ablations, but that's not really the sweet spot for focal therapy. Question. What are the options for treating recurrence after IRE treatment? Okay, that's a great question. So we were in just in London and there was a, a Cathcart, a really cool uh, uro urologist surgeon was he does he does a lot of salvage prostatectomies and he was talking about you know what it's like to salvage after cry or whatever and and he's done a handful of IRE re recurrences and I asked him what is IRE like going in there compared to the other ones because the way IRE works it it the scar tissue is minimal compared to the other types of of uh, energies. So it's much easier to do a radical prostatectomy after IRE. However, saying that the easiest thing to do is another IRE. In other words, there's no, you don't burn any bridges when you do an IRE. If there's recurrence, you can do it again. Of course, but that's the answer to that. Can you state uh, in smaller words? difference between or the advantage of IRE over proton therapy? So, so uh, the question is IRE versus proton therapy. So proton therapy I would put into the whole gland treatment. It's a type of radiation. It's a non, it's instead of x-rays, it's, it's protons. And there are basically the pitches that they're, the penetration X-ray just keeps on going. Proton stops. So proton, you can you can get a extremely precise delineation of the beam. It's the major application is in pediatric brain tumor. So if you can imagine a young child with a growing brain, a millimeter or submillimeter makes a difference. In the prostate, in a 65-year-old man, that precision with external beam versus proton, it's hard to show that it a clinically relevant distinction. Uh, so I, I would just say the question really to me is radiation versus IRE. And the answer is that even with radiation, some of my best buddies are radiation oncologists, they do an incredible job. You do have a higher instance of bowel injury that, you know, with radiation. You get the higher instance of erectile dysfunction and urinary problems with radiation than you do with IRE. There's no doubt about that. So again, it, it's quality of life. Um, the, the, the side effects are lower with IRE than with radiation. IRE is, what I've been talking about, is irreversible electroporation. IRE is the... Uh, so is there, can you do the IRE after breaking therapy? Do the seeds present a problem? You know, I, that is uh, that has not come up, that question, and I'll have to, you know, the question is, it doesn't make, it, it's not a technical issue. The question does, is the electric conductivity altered enough from the seeds that it causes a problem? And I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I'll, I'll have to, is that? Yeah, you could, yeah, that might be problematic. I, and I'll have to ask Stelling that. I'm, I, don't, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I give that answer a lot. <laughs> Question in the back. So, with recurrent metastatic disease, bone attachment with tumor in multiple locations, the IRE work in multiple sites, or do you have to go in multiple times? The question is with metastatic cancer at multiple sites, does, would IRE work? I'm going to answer that two different ways. The first one I'm going to answer is that. P patients come to us who have metastatic disease and they haven't had a local treatment yet. And the question is, is there any benefit to treating locally in a guy that has metastatic disease? You know, just apart from IRE, the urology community in general and the oncologic community in general 
has often said there's really no reason to do folk, local debulking or local treatment in the setting of metastatic disease, just use systemic therapy. That now is change shifting. And there are a number of articles talking about radiation, radiation and even surgery to remove tumor, even given a guy that has metastatic disease. The concept being that that, that primary tumor in the gland is what's seeding the, the new METs. Whether a MET begets another MET is a debatable topic in onco oncology, but we all agree that new METs will come from the primary tumor if it's not dealt with. So we do discuss with men very long discussion about whether there's any benefit to doing IRE when they've got METs and they haven't had the primary cancer treated. Your question is different, though, I think, is can we go from one MET to one MET with IRE? Uh, not really a practical situation. Uh, you have to do it multiple times. It's only, we only have a certain amount of, we have to be in one place. We have a certain amount, a limit on how big a, a tumor can be because of the technology and the, the current and the amps and all this stuff. So we can't, it, it, it's a big deal for each site. So multiple sites would be problematic. Question. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, sorry for, is IRE covered by Medicare, and if not, what is the ballpark cost of this procedure? It, it is not covered by insurance, period, and that's a long discussion about why it's how medicine works, and, and um, the cost is similar to other similar treatments. It's not trivial cost. It's a discomfort zone for me. I wish I could do it for nothing, but you know, we have fixed costs. It's in the $25,000 range. Yeah. Okay, in the back. So you've got the MRI and you can see the, the tumor. And let's say that's, not to say, it's three plus uh, four. And then in other parts of the prostate, there's also some other biopsy shows some other six and some other seven. Am I correct? This doesn't sound like it's the, the treatment. So the question is, if you have a, an index, well, you have a lesion identifiable on MRI that's been targeted and comes back three plus four. But then there's also random biopsies performed, which turn up these small foci three plus three. What does that mean? And, and that is, I didn't get into this. Part of this whole discussion on focal therapy has to do with what's called the index lesion. And it's, um, uh, what that means is we know prostate cancer is multifocal in the majority, if not all men. If you look hard enough, if I was biopsied right now because my dad had prostate cancer, he had low grade, probably didn't need to be treated, but he was, there's probably 50% chance you would find these t three plus threes, which is... The Gleason score is weird. Zero, one, three plus three is the lowest you can possibly have. You guys probably know that. The point being, we have to decide is that what we need to treat and what we don't need to treat, what we need to discover and what we don't need to discover. Um, the index lesion concept is that the largest, highest grade cancer is going to drive the clinical course, the natural history. The clones, God forbid, metastases develop, they're going to develop from that three plus four index lesion you can see. These three plus threes don't even have the hallmarks of cancer. If you looked at the, one of the slides I have it in show is hallmarks of cancer. It's the genetic signature of cancer resisting cell death, apoptosis, um, cellular signaling, um, neoangiogenesis, developing new blood vessels. There's a whole host of them and very, and these three plus threes as a rule, not always, a rule don't have these hallmarks of cancer. And there's studies that show if you only have three plus three, it's not going to cause a problem. So the answer is, it, it's not atypical what you're saying. We see an index lesion. We have to discuss with the patient these other concepts about. But if, the, but if some of the others outside the tumor are yeah. also three plus four. Okay, that, that becomes so that that's that's a that's a different situation. So then, you know, then it begs the question, you know, some patients don't have this beautiful index lesion with nothing else. And then uh, we do 
we have to talk about ablation zones. Should we, is it amenable to a quadrant ablation? Is it amenable to a hockey stick ablation? Is it amenable to a hemi ablation? We, we had a guy, one of our first guys, had a three plus four, no, four plus three, and then he had a three plus three on the other side. And he didn't like the idea of having a three plus three. And we had a frank discussion about it, and we felt we could safely ablate the three plus three as well, within this, and we, that's what he chose. So it's part of this complex process of figuring it out for each patient. I have a, a point I want to make about the precision of IRE, uh, say in contrast to brachytherapy with the seeds. The seeds radiate outward. Uh, IRE, with the four probes, it is only what's between those probes are you effectively causing anything. It doesn't radiate beyond those probes. So you can be very precise how those are positioned. And that's where the precision comes in. And that's how you can repeat the, that uh, treatment too. It's not damaging other tissue around there. Now, uh, because this gentleman, Dr. Cooper, is standing here and you're wondering why maybe he's here, uh, I'd like him to talk a little bit about targeting uh, using the MRI, using the MRI to target a biopsy. Because uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine just published the precision study. You want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, and Dr. Schwartzberg has to leave. He's got to get back to work. So, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, we're using, we've done now, I think, 107 inbore biopsies, targeted biopsies. And, and so what we used is that the MRI that a patient has had before the biopsy to find what looks suspicious. And then we target that area and we do it actually, what I like to say is a target within a target. So you remember that one uh, slide that Ross showed that had the coronal image, the heart-shaped gland, and there was a little spot there that looked suspicious. That's still not good enough for us because we're able now with this technology on three Tesla or even a one five Tesla, and we do a number of of our imaging on a 1.5 is to find out actually which 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 voxels or which cells in that say one centimeter tumor are the most suspicious and we do that by it gets kind of into some real heady physics about how water diffuses and and the higher the cell volume the tumor cell volume the 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 less water can diffuse and we can actually measure that and it's a number and we can quantify it so when a patient's on the table for the biopsy we'll interrogate that one lesion, find the area there that has the most, what we call restricted diffusion or the water molecules move the least. That's, wh that's where we know that the, the tumor cell density is the highest and it actually correlates nicely with the Gleason score. So the lower the ADC, which is just an acronym for how the water molecules move, the higher the likelihood of cancer and the higher that likelihood is a higher Gleason. So what we do um, is, is bring a patient in, it's super easy, we hear these horrible stories, my father included, of these kind of blind trust biopsies done without anesthesia, and 12, 16 passes, I think a lot of people in here could speak to that. I'm sorry, I'm on call, I've got to cover my imaging center. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. 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 Great guy there. Um, and so, uh, so what we do is we, we bring you in, we do all these, we do most of the imaging on the three Tesla magnet, as George said. For the biopsies, we don't need that field strength, the higher, so we do it on a 1.5 at the Encinitas office where we have our interventional nurse, Diane, there. So we bring you in, I go over the images with you, tell you what we're gonna do. She puts an IV in, gives a, a same cocktail as a colonoscopy, a little fentanyl, a little Versed. We kind of get you where you won't care. We put you on your stomach, for this procedure instead of your back for the diagnostic MRI, um, and put a little needle guide in there that's about as big around as a maybe a, 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 pen, a ballpoint pen, and it's, it holds the needle, an 18-gauge needle, and, and then literally what we do is put you in there, rescan, find the lesion, double-click on it with a mouse, everything's computer kind of software-driven, and it tells us how to move the stand that's holding the needle guide, you know, up, down, in, out, clockwise, counterclockwise, get it right on target, and then we fire the needle, put you back in, rescan, and make sure we're where we need to be, take the biopsies, and we're done. And the procedure itself, the, 
the taking of the, of the biopsy or the tissue is probably literally 30 seconds. We take, you know, about four passes, but the whole procedure takes us about, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get you plugged in. And let me, okay, let me, let me just say one other thing that occurs to me because I won't, I won't, I won't remember. <laughs> um, so I think the gold standard now, it looks like it's going to be MRI targeted in board biopsy. Well, obviously nationwide, a lot of places don't have the resources for this and, and the standard of care up to now has been ultrasound guided. So the next best thing is to say, okay, well, if you can use the MRI for the target and we know where we're going, then why not use that as a roadmap and be able to do it with ultrasound? And that, that has kind of ushered in this whole new field of uh, fusion biopsy, which you've heard of, and, and Ross alluded to, Genesis now has that software and that ability. So what we do is we do the MRI and we still get the information we need, the most suspicious areas to biopsy. Those images are kind of married or fused onto the ultrasound images. And so that it, there's a lot of studies showing how poor ultrasound is in finding the tumor. The only reason you use it for a, a truss biopsy, transrectal ultrasound, is to, to see the gland, literally. Make sure you're not going to biopsy the bladder or the bone. Up to 60% of tumors you can't even see on ultrasound. So now if you have the MRI, you know exactly where it is on ultrasound, it will it'll, you know, kind of put a, a layover on the ultrasound image real time. So while the operator's holding the, the transducer, it tells you where to go. And that's the next best thing. And there's a lot of studies done. It shows maybe one, two, three millimeters of misregistration between the ultrasound fusion biopsy and the MRI inbore biopsy. But I think most people are willing to forgive that just because it's so much better than the current uh, trust biopsy without, without uh, guidance. Yes? I wanted to ask, since you're on this topic and you mentioned ADC, isn't that, uh, that figure, the ADC, something that's going to lead towards being able to use MRIs as diagnostic of cancer? itself, not just indicative. Is it, are we looking at MRIs getting to the point where they can be re-diagnostic? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is the, referring to the ADC, which gets into some of the physics. I'll tell you about that in just a second, and whether you can actually use that as a, as a tissue diagnosis, basically, without having to put a needle in and do anything invasive. Uh, it may be going that way. I think what probably would will get there faster is this molecular imaging. Uh, which is a, a whole new area, and, and Dr. Schechter is going to be here. I saw next Ju uh, or June, the next talk, I think. Given he's he's in our group as well. He does a lot of the nuclear medicine, and, and and a lot of that is is molecular based as far as being able to make a diagnosis. Uh, it's very good. It's probably not that good. So let me back up a minute. The ADC is is an acronym. Everything in MRI is an acronym, including MRI. And uh, ADC stands for apparent diffusion coefficient. And all that is is, is how far, if you put a, a beaker of, of water in a magnet, those water molecules are going to move all over. This is Brownian motion. This is one of Einstein's first papers. And they're, it's unrestricted. It can go every, anywhere it wants. And the reason it moves is it just gets into the physics of MRI, which is a strong magnetic field. It's about 10 to 15,000 times the magnetic field of Earth. Earth is, we well, want to get into that. But... Anyhow, so the water molecules, they move because a proton, a, a, a hydrogen atom is H2O. There's two hydrogen atoms on a water molecule. They're like little magnets. They're positively charged, and you put them in a magnetic field, they start going crazy. So if you get something in there that restricts the ability to do that, meaning tumor cell volume, we use it, actually, it was originally developed in the brain for stroke, and it's the same principle where, but for different reasons, where the, the water molecules get restricted. They can't move around, and that's what we're able to measure with this, with this ADC. And because most of the reason for an elevated PSA, most of the reason for an abnormal MRI is not cancer, it helps, it's a, just a tool we use to be able to say, well, this looks like it's probably gonna be cancer or high likelihood we should biopsy versus not. But to be able to say your ADC because it's this number is cancer, I think most people wouldn't feel comfortable. It's for sure not treating based on that without really knowing what you're while you're treating, if that makes sense. Were, there, were you already had a question? Okay, yeah. 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 you two have had questions? Okay, you, sir. Uh, back to the presentation work. Uh, 
I, I, I'm not familiar with the Han tables that he was talking yes. about, where you go ahead and put in your PSA score, your Gleason score, and your clinical stage. The purpose of that is to come up with the aggressiveness, to know how, to, to, what the, pur the purpose of that is to tell you what. Good question. The, referring to the Han tables, which came out of Hopkins, that is based on thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, retrospective prostatectomy specimens. The purpose of that is somebody who is treatment naive, meaning they've never had any treatment. They go to their doctor, they have an elevated PSA, they, they've had a biopsy and know what the Gleason is and what clinical stage. What the Han table show is your probability in numerical form of recurring after a radical prostatectomy at three, five, seven, and 10 years out. So if you had a, what, you just put it in there, it's very user interactive, a three plus four, a, a, a stage, T2 PSA of, of eight, it will tell you in three years your probability of recurrence after radical treatment is 2%, 1%, 20%, and it goes up from there. So three, five, seven, and 10. And, and the point of that is that it doesn't, it, we're learning that the, any patient's prognosis is very much based on the biology of that, his specific tumor. And so not all tumors, not all Gleason 7s are created equal, not all 3 plus 4s are 3 plus 4s, and even if you take it out with the most radical treatment, if you watch it, if you do focal therapy, it's going to kind of behave the way it wants to. And, and that's what the Han tables kind of give you an idea. If, if you were going to go for the most radical treatment, this is the probability that's going to come back. And we, we like to think of it, you know, obviously there are some very bad actors, prostate cancer, Gleason's, that just are gonna do what they wanna do regardless. But like Ross said, it's more kind of thinking about this as a chronic disease and being able to manage it accordingly. And a gentleman back here had the question about if you had an index lesion or in, in, the, in the prostate of a, say a, three plus, a four plus three and then other smaller areas, now we have, with the MRI, have the ability to, to uh, comfortably and accurately follow patients in, in this, even if they've, whether they've had treatment or not with active surveillance. And, it tends to be very slow growing. So if something crops up one year down the road or five or 10, then we biopsy that lesion or retreat that lesion. It's, it's, it's a very different animal than some of the other cancers you hear about, lung, and prostate. By and large, it is. I mean, there's some, some more aggressive ones, but fortunately, they're, they're more unusual. Good question over here. All right. Double difference. For what other types of cancer is IRE used to treat? Actually, it's mostly used in this country, if not the world, for uh, solid tumors like liver, pancreas, kidney. UCSD's done several of them with kidney and liver. Um, and you, you just need some kind of imaging guidance to get these electrodes in the right place. And how you, you know, it depends on where the tumor is as to what imaging. So sometimes you can use CAT scan. Uh, you, you just need to be able to see where you're putting these things. Um, but those are probably more common than prostate, those three, liver, liver, pancreas, and kidney. Is it ever used for breast cancer? Uh, yet, uh, there are some, some people trying to do this for breast, as well as cryo and other kind of focal therapies. Yes, very much so. It's kind of an exciting area. Right here. You mentioned uh, 3 plus 4, 4 plus 3. Can you uh, sort of talk about the difference between those numbers? Yeah. It's so, the, the, the Gleason, it, it's such a, it's a, oh yes, uh, he, the gentleman asked if uh, we talked, we kind of throw these numbers out like a Gleason 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3 or whatever, and, and a little bit more about that history. So Don Gleason was a pathologist at, at the VA in, in uh, I think, Minnesota, and he developed these this, this table that we still use, what, 50, 60 years later, the Gleason tables, uh, the Gleason score, and he did it originally on, on patients who had a TERP, so a transurethral prostatectomy, which is a treatment for BPH. For, it's just a plumbing treatment. You have trouble peeing, you go in there and kind of do a rotor rooter and take some of the tissues out. Well, he would look at the tissue under a microscope, and he said, well, you know, there's, these cells look different than normal cells. So he developed this this system, the Gleason score, and basically what it is is that, you know, most of biology and cancer is a spectrum. So if something doesn't go from a normal cell to a aggressively cancer, you know, a very aggressive cancer like that. It's kind of a, it's kind of a progression. 
and that progression, he just gave a number, and the number is one through, or zero through five, but he said, well, maybe we can make that a little bit more accurate, because if you take out a bunch of tissue, you can see a bunch of different cells here, and maybe, you know, there may be some threes, some twos, some ones. So he said, why don't we take two different, two different specimens, and we'll look at each specimen and say, find the, the, the most abnormal looking cell and give that the highest number on a scale of zero to five. So if there are no abnormal cells, it's a zero or it's a one. And what you do is, and then you take the next slide and find out what the next most prevalent abnormal cell is. And so if they're all the same cells, if they're all a one, they're all normal, then you get a one plus one. You add those two up and the cumulative score is the Gleason score. That was the case until 2004, and then the International Europathology Society got together and said, well, even though this scale goes from zero or one to 10, we don't even, cancer doesn't even enter the, the discussion until about a six, meaning if you have anything less than a six or a three plus three, these cells are just normal looking. They're, they don't turn into cancer, they're not cancer, so that's not even cancer. And so right away you can see, well, if you have a scale of one to 10, and somebody gets a Gleason 6, they go, God, I'm already past halfway. This must be a pretty aggressive cancer. So it can be very, very misleading, but we still use it because it has stood the test of time, the Gleason score. A lot of other people have tried to not disprove it, but to find more accurate ways to diagnose the cancer, and this just seems to hold up well. And so a 3 plus 3, like Ross was saying, there's been a ton of studies. There's also discussions on whether that should even be considered cancer because it, it, it's never been shown to metastasize, it does not have the molecular hall, hallmarks of cancer. So we really start talking about cancer when you get a four. And so now the next, the next most logical thing, if you look at that and you go, well, wait a minute, this is somebody looking at a microscope at, a tish, at some tissue, and you can see how subjective that is. I mean, these things, you know, you look under a microscope and look at cells, they don't have little numbers on them. These, these guys are looking at these things going, well, that looks abnormal to me. And the next guy, yeah, I guess that's kind of abnormal. I think that maybe is a three. And the other guy, no, nah, maybe that's a four. There's been tons of studies done on the inter and intra observer variability of a Gleason score. And it can be 30 to 50%, meaning that if, if I looked at, I'm not a pathologist, but if I looked at this, I say, well, that looks like a, a Gleason six to me. And I give it to Ross. He goes, no, nah, I think that's a seven. That could happen 25, 30, 40, 50% of the time. And you can see how, you know, once you look under the hood, it's not as, as black and white or cut and dried as you'd like to see, because all these treatment decisions are based on, you know, if you, somebody had a six, a pathologist said this is a six, and another pathologist said that's a seven, well, you might get treatment for the seven, if that's what that pathologist said. And we were, I was at a conference not long ago in, in, um, with uh, Bernadette Greenwood, her group, she's been here to speak before. She's in desert medical imaging, and they're doing MRI-guided laser therapy, another type of focal therapy, and, it, she put on a conference there, and there was a pathologist, I can't remember his name, from Canada, and I had asked him about, you know, this kind of intra and inter-observer inter variability of a Gleason, and he said in their circles, in their pathology circles, there's an, they have this anecdotal story of Don Gleason himself saying that his own opinion would change up to 50% looking at the same slide in the morning versus the afternoon. So you can see that it's not... It, it, there's a lot of subjective variation there, but it's as good as we have. And, and fortunately, it's not, a, it's not a variation like one pathologist would say this is a six and another one would call it a 10, something like that. It's more nuanced than that, but it's still, it's subjective. Same thing in radiology. One person would look at an x-ray and say, this looks normal. Another one would look at it and say, no, there may be a little pneumonia right there. Uh, it's just, uh, but that's as good as, as we have for the time being. When I was uh, first diagnosed, I had a Gleason uh, of uh, 4 plus 3, and then it became uh, 5 plus 3, and now it's uh, 5 plus uh, 4, I'm 9, Gleason 9. So I went from a Gleason uh, 7 to a Gleason 9. If I had one, it's a Gleason 10 now. The structure has changed from the time. <coughs> So three plus four and four plus three is basically to seven. Okay so, okay, so I didn't finish that discussion. So the way they get the number, they look at the slides. We talked about that. So what they're doing is they're looking at, in a, in a given high-power field, 
the most abnormal cell and give that a number. So if the most abnormal cell is a three, then they take the second most abnormal cell. This is just in percentage looking there. So if you look at, at 100 cells under this high power field and say 60 of them, we'll say 70 of them are, are a three, then the first number is a three. The next most abnormal cell, say 20% of these things look like a four, then, you're, then you add those and it's a three plus four. So the first number in Gleason is, is the, the prevalence of the most abnormal cell. So if you look at a, a, another example, you look at 100 cells in a high power field and the most abnormal cell, 70% of them are a four and 20% of them are a three, then your score is a four plus three. And the reason that's, imp sevens are particularly troublesome because they're kind of low grade slash intermediate. They're kind of these tweeners, we call them. And, and you, it's not enough information to say I have a Gleason seven. What you really need to know is it, well, is it a three plus four or is it a four plus three? Because you can see if it's a four plus three, you have more abnormal cells that are higher grade than a three plus four, if that makes sense. It's, if, if that doesn't make sense, it's because I'm not explaining well. It's actually pretty simple, um, but it can be a little confusing just because you have to add two numbers together. An eight, say, or a 10, it doesn't matter because all your cells, all your abnormal cells are a four, right? So you get a four plus four, that's an eight. All your abnormal cells are a five, you get a five plus five, that's a 10. A nine almost doesn't matter because that's, we consider that you know, high risk, very aggressive. Whether it's a five plus four or a four plus five, that's all very high risk. It's the sevens, and the sixes don't really seem to cause much trouble at all. So it's the sevens that are really the ones that are that we spend a little bit more time looking at and diagnosing. And for that reason, a, a number of patients that say, we do the biopsy and, and where we send the pathology to after, after the, M, the MRI biopsy is dictated by whatever your insurance is. We don't have a say in that, um, but it's very common for a patient to want a second opinion. And so we will send that, those slides off typically to Hopkins. They're kind of the, the heavy hitters in this country for, for uropathology, for prostate cancer, and get a second opinion. And very much more often than not, it doesn't change much. Again, it's not like a local pathologist says, you got a three plus four and you send it to Hopkins and you got a five plus five. It's, it's not, like, not like that. And we got time for two more questions. One over here. Uh, okay, you get another one. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cooper, yes. during uh, Dr. Cooper's presentation, it appeared to me that there was a contradiction about uh, re potential recurrence rate for people who choose IRE. At one point he said, I believe, if I understood correctly, he said it's comparable to uh, uh, a radical prostatectomy. And then at another point there was a study he had up there that through very fast, but it said recurrence 5% in 50 months on the bottom of where you have a chart of all the different uh, okay. effects. And I'm wondering, what actually is, so? because Dr. Shaling has done 700 of these, mm. what is known so far as far as recurrence rates, and how does that compare to uh, mainstream uh, 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 treatments? A great question. So the question is, uh, the recurrence rates of IRE or nano knife versus rad radical or, or kind of conventional therapy, whole gland therapy. And Dr. Stelling, yeah, has done a, the largest series in the world, which is about to be published, and it's over 700, although he's publishing it on about 500. And his experience is, what he will tell you is it's basically, his results are almost the same as the Han tables. Meaning that what, what we talked about earlier about, you know, you plug in your, your Gleason score, your clinical stage, your PSA, and it'll tell you your probability of recurrence one, three, five, seven, ten 10 years after radical therapy. His is the same. The advantage of, of, of the focal therapy is that you don't have the side effects that you do with, with the whole gland, the more radical therapy. So if you have, if, if, and, and it gets back to what we were talking about earlier about the biology of the, of the tumor. It's going to do what it wants to do. And so if you can, if you can treat it, debulk it, kind of, you know, make it more chronic, buy more time with fewer side effects, I think that's the goal. If you, you know, anybody can go in there and take that thing out and then you can be incontinent and impotent for the rest of your life. Well, that's, that, nobody wants that. So if you can get the same result, but with a lot less of the side effects, then that's kind of what all focal therapy 
is, is aimed toward. So his results, just to get to answer your question, are, are similar to the Han tables. And I think that, I can't remember exactly what you're referring to about the one little caption at the bottom of 5%. I think maybe all comers, all Gleason's, all clinical stages, uh, IRE, this is, this is the recurrence rate, but I, I don't remember that exact slide. That would be, uh, that's correct, but it depends on what, you know, uh, what kind of Gleason, what kind of tumors you include in that. So if you don't have many high grade, and again, most of this is being used for lower grade tumors. That's, yeah. All right, question over here. Yes, I, I, I was not familiar with the discussion about prostate density as being a factor, you know, when you divide the two, so you come up with a little change depending upon the size of the prostate. Sure. And how is that? I mean, oh. that's, not, that's, that's, not utilized, that's not a factor, for example, in the Han table. That's something separate. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, that's correct. The Han, yeah. So the, okay, so two things. The, the Han table, we use those two, those two um, parameters. He, he's referring to the prostate density and then the Han table. Um, so the Han tables we use once you have a biopsy and you know the Gleason score. The prostate density is when you haven't even had a biopsy, you go to your doctor, your PSA is elevated, and that's all we know. Well, what's causing the PSA to be elevated? The, one of the least likely reasons is actually cancer. And usually it's prostatitis, just a, a low-grade inflammation that most men don't even know they have. Not, this is not a, even though it's itis, like it's inflamed, you think of appendicitis and you go to the hot, most of these are kind of what we call sleb, subclinical, you don't even know you had it. So a prostatitis is the most common and BPH is the most common. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is just a biologic fact. So every male, throughout the course of his life, the prostate gland just gets bigger, it hypertrophies. And most people think that every male with time will get cancer, will get prostate cancer. It's a foregone conclusion, it just has to do with the biology of, of those cells. So the PSA density is just a way, if you have a PSA of 10, well, what's causing that PSA of 10? It's not likely to be cancer. It's probably more like a prostatitis or a BPH and more likely BPH. So the BPH, what it does is it takes the volume of the gland because the PSA, prostate-specific antigen, is made by prostate cells. So the more prostate cells you have, the higher your PSA is going to be. So you take the PSA value of 10 and divide it by the volume of the gland, and that gives you the density. It kind of, it's kind of a, it levels the playing field, so you know that the PSA, whatever, is it, is it elevated because you just have a bunch of cells, normal cells or hypertrophic cells causing it, or is it elevated because of some other reason? So that's all the den that's that's all the density is. Okay, we want to thank Dr. Cooper. Oh, thank you. And, you know, he's one of the few oh. here that does targeted biopsy in the San Diego area. So if you have that consideration, which I think is very important, consider having it targeted. And uh, here the gentleman does an excellent job of that. Thanks again. Oh, of course. My, my recommendation along those lines is is if. Most people here have a diagnosis, but if you have friends or family that, that have an elevated PSA, do not have a, a blind trust biopsy done. Even though that's the standard of care, we can do, and we do do so much better than that. Whether you have it in bore, whether you have it with Genesis and it's fusion, that doesn't matter. What matters is you get the right test done, and that's an image-directed, targeted biopsy. That's the take-home from this whole discussion. Get you on the right course. <laughs>